Skinny for Friday, November 8th. Some 55 hours plus after the Associated Press named Donald Trump officially the winner of the White House. With me, as always, are my two colleagues, uh, Ray Rowe, the editor-in-chief of Creative Loafing, and independent reporter and author Ben Montgomery. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. It's only been 55 hours, not 55 days. No. Okay. Just counting. It's just so... so um, Anyway, good to see you both here. Good to see um, you, Mitch. Yeah, Ben, good to, good to see you. You know, some of the Welcome listeners back. may have heard that we, uh, Ray and I were on Shelley's Reback show on Wednesday, and that was that was a good time as, as guests. Uh, we're, we're, we're happy to have Ben with us, of course. And guys, we're going to get into it today, and I want to encourage our listeners. You know, obviously, this is a, a big time here to deal with this, the ramifications of the election, both nationally and here in Florida. And we want to, you know, open up the phones in a few minutes here, 813-239-9663. You can also email us at dj at wmnf.org. We really want to hear from you today, give you the opportunity to speak. And we also have a couple guests here uh, that we're going to, uh, you know, dissect again and where we go forward here in this election. Um, basically, of course, you know, I was at, on Tuesday night, I was at the Yes on Four event, Amendment Four, of course, that was the abortion rights measure in St. Petersburg, uh, which we all know got 57% support. So the public in Florida supported that. They did support repealing the six-week abortion ban, but with our laws that we have here, by the way, uh, uh, voted on by the Floridians, not by the, the legislature in 2006. That's why we have to have 60% threshold. That wasn't good enough. Uh, pro-choice measures also failed in South Dakota and Nebraska, where they enshrined a 12-week ban. But voters did approve initiatives in Colorado, Maryland, New York, uh, also Montana, Missouri, Arizona, and Nevada. I was reading, in, I think it's in Colorado, that actually did get 60%. So there was one state in the country this, this week that actually did get to that 60% threshold. They did not have to get that high, but they did. Um, those are all states where Trump won or is leading. Uh, pro-choice measures failed, like I said, here uh, in South Dakota, Nebraska. Okay. Um, okay, so what does this mean for us going forward? Well, joining us in the studio to talk about this is Bree Wallace. She's the director of case management for the Tampa Bay Abortion Fund. Uh, that is a nonprofit organization that helps remove financial and logistical barriers to abortion care, including financial assistance for local procedures or for travel assistance for those needing to leave the state due to the uh, restrictive six-week ban. Uh, good morning, Bree. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. It's nice to have you here. Uh, I read the Tampa Bay Times story yesterday. Chris O'Donnell had a piece about, and uh, by the way, in our Florida Phoenix today, we, we are in, in the, the lead piece that we have this morning. Um, Tampa Bay Abortion Fund has awarded more than $700,000 to about 150 women to pay for clinic appointments, travel, and accommodation costs in places like uh, Maryland and Washington, D.C. since the six-week abortion ban went into effect. Um, let's get into that, but let me talk about you first, Bree. Um, where were you at watching the returns on Tuesday night when you heard about Amendment 4 going down? I was actually on the Yes uh, on 4 Party 2 in Oh, you were? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I kind of left when I, I knew it was going wrong, so I, I, I went to a Chili's with my friends to go cry and drink there, and then I stayed up till 4.30 to watch the presidential election, and then I just cried some more, so it was it was rough. How are you doing now? Um, I mean, I'm just working. I think this is the time to kind of throw yourself into organizing, collaborating, doing as much, you know, as you can for your community and the people around you. So I'm trying to utilize the momentum we have right now and all the rage that people are feeling. So talk to us. I think, you know, I describe what you guys do there, uh, helping out women who need help, need to go because they, uh, where's, how's that been going? I mean, we had you on several months ago. Yeah, that was like, uh... It was, we were, what, days into, six weeks into six-week yeah. band. That was 44 days. Uh, like, does that feel like a lifetime ago? <laughs> yes, I feel like it's been years. And, I mean, sadly, you know, we're going to have years more of this. We're not we're not getting rid of six-week bands for at least two to four years if we're lucky. So I think it's just going to be continuing to do that. And, you know, my work has changed a lot. It's working with getting people out of state, you know, them having to travel thousands of miles, having to pay for flights and hotels and ride share and childcare and, you know, procedure costs and, you know, costs only go up and people, some of these are urgent cases. You're buying flights for the next day. So it's just us spending a lot of money for this, which, you know, we will, we will gladly do as long as we can. And we're always going to be here to, you know, help our community with the, what they need, especially when it comes to, you know, a human right, you know, abortion, is healthcare, and we're just going to keep working and helping everyone we possibly can, and working through these barriers. Yeah, you, that's it. Oh, go ahead. No, uh, you've uh, been there. How long have you been the abortion? Tampa Bay Abortion Fund. Um, Twenty twenty. 
Okay, so, right, so you, you, you've been there when there was just normal, like, you know, 24 weeks, basically, then it went to 15 weeks in 2022, and now, just again, since May, we've had the six-week ban. Um, has the, well, obviously, the work changed for you when we got these bans themselves, because people were coming to Florida, right, back yeah. a few years ago, to get out of other places. Then, of course, everything changed. Uh, well, the 15-week law that we put into effect, that actually happened before Dobbs went down. Um, the Dobbs decision happened in uh, May of 2022. Uh, or was it, I think, yeah, right, or July 22, anyway, right before the summertime. Uh, so, right, so it's been different, right? It must have be different in those four years you've been there with the different laws taking place. Again, now since May 1st, we've had the six-week ban. Uh, how And how are you guys doing financially? And obviously you rely a lot on people helping you out, just writing checks for you guys. Yeah, I mean, we are mainly we get donations and that's how we pretty much pay for most things. We try to apply for grants, but you know, grants for abortions are very scarce and there's so many, you know, abortion funds throughout the US that also need these. So, you know, we're all kind of like applying for the same thing. So we really do rely on, um, you know, donations from people. We get like family foundations that send them in, people from their retirement accounts, uh, monthly donors. So it's really, that we're doing our end of year fundraiser right now. And I think we've gotten like over 20,000 since the election, which is great. But that's the thing about elections and Dobbs and when big things happen is, yeah, you get a lot of donations then and then they fall completely off. So it's really just keeping the momentum and there's not gonna be another big event for a few years. We have to keep people engaged in this and have them channel into something and, you know, just keep donating, become like, a monthly donor and just, I saw so many campaigns um, raise so much money this election. I mean, yes, on four got over a hundred million. So there's money out there. We're not, you know, it's not, not a thing. Right. So we need pretty much these rich people to now actually give to abortion because that's all that's left for us to do right now is help people pay for their abortions. Yeah. None of those states that Mitch mentioned at the top of the show that did pass measures are close to Florida, right? But it's important to know that uh, abortion is still legal in Florida. And yes. that number 20,000 popped out because last time you were here, you mentioned that an abortion can cost anywhere between 500 to $20,000, <laughs> depending yeah. on how far somebody has to travel. You alluded to these rage donations. And I think since the six-week ban went to effect, uh, a press release from you guys said you've pledged 401000 to cover these costs. That's 739 people. But there has to be a cap on how many people you guys can actually serve, right? You're just gonna, do we know that number? Um, you know, honestly, we are spending the money that we have. We don't close unless, you know, I'm out of office and I'm our one staff and I literally can't do anything. That's like really the only time we've been closing. We know that there is an urgent need right now and you know, we try to just keep fundraising and helping. So, I mean, we have like cut down to only working with specific clinics in Tampa and only helping Hillsborough and Pinellas people travel. But, you know, there's other abortion funds in Florida that help out with that as well. But we haven't ever turned anyone away. If they're not in our area, we'll connect you with another fund. Um, and yeah, I mean, you touched up on abortion is still legal here. And I think there's a lot of fear mongering going on right now that, you know, we have a near total abortion ban, which isn't wrong, but we don't have a, ban. a total abortion yeah. ban. We have six weeks. There are still, I think, uh, Guttmacher put that there was still over 5,000 abortions happening in uh, June and July here. So they're still happening. Less numbers, of course, but we want people to know that you can go to a clinic here. You don't have to go out of state per se. Um, you know, it's good to kind of keep track of your periods right now and, you know, be diligent in that. But, you know, it, it's still happening here. And we especially want to keep our local clinics open and, you know, have that resource for people. Are you concerned uh, about what's going to happen under this new administration? You know, the Democrats, Donald Trump has been uh, said that he is, does not support a national abortion ban. In fact, he, there was a thought that he might come out against Amendment 4 at one point. He, remember, he floated that out there. He got mm -hmm. so much abuse, and then he's like, oh, no, never mind. Uh, he did support Amendment 3, the, the cannabis measure here in Florida. Um, but by the way, you know, we were both at that event. Lauren Brunzel, who was the campaign director for Yes on Forum, this is what she said uh, at the watch party in St. Pete after the vote came in. She said, quote, a minority have decided that Amendment 4 will not be adopted. The reality is a majority of Floridians in which is the most... Uh, what is the most important presidential election in Florida history just voted to end Florida's abortion ban. 
Uh, Republicans, Democrats, and independents do not support these extreme bans on abortion. They are tired of women dying because of abortion bans. They are tired of women being forced to giving birth to children who die in their arms because of abortion bans. They are tired of doctors being threatened with prison sentences because of abortion bans. She also called for the legislature saying that this is a direct mandate against a six-week law that the legislature should go back to Tallahassee next spring and change the law. And, of course, nobody thinks that's going to happen, right? No. No, I mean, I you kind of uh, touched upon um, what organizing now and things like that, and you guys have talked about your monthly donor option. There's been a lot of fundraisers. I think there's a concert in December mm-hmm. happening, and a lot of promoters have done that. Um, but in your four years at TBAF, two of them were as volunteers. Mm-hmm. Um, can you talk a little bit about the role that volunteers play at your organization, and if there's anybody out there listening who's wondering how can I get involved, what does being a volunteer at your organization look like? Yeah, I mean, I don't think we have the capacity to take people on right now. There's so much training that goes into this because you need to know exactly what to say and what not to say. But, you know, our volunteers are vital and really it's just our community. I mean, the benefit show that's happening is just people in the community doing things for us. They don't, you know, come to us and say, like, can you help us with this? They put it on and they say, if you want to come, come. And I think that's the biggest thing that helps us is just like artists, you know, tattoo artists, photographers, um, people do like raffles and fundraisers and that helps, you know, more than you would ever know. And it takes a lot off of us because again, being the only staff, we volunteer management's a full-time job. It really is. And we love and appreciate everyone, but it's so hard to (laughs) manage volunteers. But I do really encourage people to become part of their community and go to these events and maybe join orgs that are taking people and that do stuff for abortion. Um, and, you know, just really like connecting because these politicians are never coming to save us. We are the only people that are going to keep us safe. So knowing your community and knowing your people around you really make, you know, all the difference. But when I did start out, I was doing, um, intake when it was a lot easier and now it's literally a full-time job. We had to make it a job, but we have people that, you know, table for us, um, like send out thank you notes, just talk to people about us, find us grants, things like that. There's definitely things to do. What is is the, speaking of, what is the next, I mean, there must be something, some activity, some protest, something on the horizon, right? Is there relief out there? And what what are you looking forward to in terms of activity? Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of events happening right now. There's a lot of benefit shows. I'm trying to do like a little like craft and chat event for like our community where, you know, we're all really sad and mad right now. And I know we are. And I want us to just have like a room together to kind of feel that energy, but also, you know, do some fun things and talk. So I'm trying to get that set up. And, you know, the number one thing is follow our social medias to know when these events are happening and what we're doing. Um, What's the social media? How can people follow you? Yeah. So on Instagram, it's TBA Fund. On Facebook, it's Tampa Bay Abortion Fund. Um, same as our website is tbafund.com and it has all that on there. Um, And we should tell people, again, we're speaking with Bree Wallace from the Tampa Bay Abortion Fund uh, about uh, where we're at here in this state, in this country. By the way, um, the Associated Press, Newark Center for Public Affairs, researched at a poll. It said uh, at least 70% of Americans oppose a federal ban on abortion or a ban on the procedure at six weeks. Um, Again, Donald Trump, uh, if he does decide to curb access, experts say that could include limiting the use of medication abortion, particularly what is administered through telehealth or delivered by the mail. Last year, according to Guttmacher, uh, 63% of all abortions in the U.S. were done through uh, the the pill, basically. Mm -hmm. So if you want to stop that, that would stop a lot of abortions in this country. So that's, I think, the, one of the biggest concerns, I would think, that going into this Trump administration, you don't have to do a national abortion ban. You can just stop that pill from being distributed across state lines and get the same effect. Yeah. Can I ask you to riff off of Mitch's question from earlier after after the vote came in? Have you have your has your fund or any of the other state funds heard from the Yes on Four uh, infrastructure and leadership there to say whether or not they would be organizing to help raise money for these funds? Um, kind of, yeah. I talked with Lauren a little bit, and I think she's going to try to work with us on some things. Because, you know, like I said, they got over $100 million. Right. They mm-hmm. know a lot of connections now. Um, and I think, you know, we can work together through all of this because they're going to be organizing the next few years, I'm sure. But there's really nothing we can do but fund abortions right now. So I do think hopefully we can work together um, 
on Do, that, and yeah. they had some great people on that. Well, I, I, I'm wondering, again, that is such a big effort, but, you know, the idea of coming back in 2026 with a constitutional amendment, I know it's raw right now, and nobody's going to be talking about that for the moment. Uh, but, like, I, I think this, by the way, might also be possible with Amendment 3. We saw this with medical marijuana a decade ago when it lost in 2014, getting 57% of the vote. It came back in 2016, I think, got over 70% of the vote. Uh, if the money is there, which it, it is in the marijuana and the cannabis situation, with truly spending $100 million more of their own, uh, that money is out there nationally for people who don't want to see this happen in Florida, an important state. Whatever we think about where it's at right now in, in terms of uh, uh, being a, a ruby red state. It's not a red state, no, it's a ruby red mm-hmm. state. Uh, but indeed, yeah. So, um, right. So, so Bree, you're going to keep on carrying on, obviously. What else can we do at this point? Uh, and, um, yeah, anything else? No, I mean, I think we're going to talk about this with Barry a little bit, but you alluded to this, Bree, and it, we're so fresh off of this. Do you think Democrats or alleged left-leaning leaders of parties have learned anything uh, from this election? No, <laughs> I don't. And I think I'm a registered Democrat, and there are Democrats out there that I like, but like I said, these politicians are never coming to save us, and they have their own agendas, and... You know, we were supposed to codify Roe v. Wade a million times, but Democrats run off of it so much that why would they do that? Right. Good We've fundraising. put ourselves into this situation when we could have got out of it so long ago, and now we just lost the whole government. We're all red now. That we're not going back for a long time. So, Bree, you considered uh, running for state office actually earlier this year. What seat? What district was that going to be? Right. Uh, district sixty six. Yeah. Tracy Coster is the state rep there. Mm-hmm. Okay, and. Uh, yeah, that she of course won re-election on uh, on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, would you still consider doing something like that, or no? I think when I'm maybe a little bit older. Yeah, you're honestly. young. You're, what, you're like 27. Yeah, I'm 27, so maybe in my 30s or 40s. I think right now my best <laughs> my best work is grassroots and mutual aid and just trying to be a part of the community because you don't want someone in the government that doesn't care about you. You want someone that has shown that they will work for you and they have your best interest and they come from the same lifestyle as you. We don't want these rich politicians that don't care that come out of nowhere to keep running. Right, right. Okay, I think we're going to transition. Bree, stick, stick around if you want to here. Uh, we're going to talk to, we're going to bring Barry Edwards in. Barry Edwards, a longtime political consultant uh, for working for both Democrats and Republicans in, in Tampa Bay for uh, 40 years, I guess it has been now at this point. Yes. Whom you might have heard in the last segment. Yes, we did <laughs> Barry, not know. Barry, Barry, do you live at WMNF now? We, I get my news from two sources, WMNF and La Gazetta. Oh, oh right. no. <laughs> so, so, um, <laughs> and Creative Loafing. And, 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 okay, and by sure. the way, we really do want to open the phones up. 813-239-9663. Let's talk about your thoughts right now about, uh, we're going to get into Florida right now, Florida politics, obviously. It was a brutal night for Democrats on Tuesday, but you know what? We say that after every election, quite frankly. I can't remember the last time I didn't say that. Um, Certainly not in 22, certainly not in 2020, certainly not in 2018. The difference in 2018, frankly, and before that, 2014, 2010, when Rick Scott was winning these one-point victories, is when Democrats had hundreds of thousands of more voters registered than Republicans in this state. Or millions more. Okay, and we're a long way away from that now. Think about it, let's talk, Barry, about the state party. Um, they had a goal, okay? Again, when you're so down so low, you want to start modestly. So in the Florida legislature, there's a, quote, super majority in both the Senate, House, and Senate. And uh, Democrats wanted to get, what, at least five seats, I think. They needed to get six seats. So to, six seats to get, overcome the supermajority. And they, lo- and they actually lost a seat. They lost a seat. So the supermajority increased in the House. So it's right now, I believe, uh, 80, um, 80, is it 86? A- uh, 85, 35. Okay, 85 Republicans, 35 Democrats. It remains in the Senate, 28 Republicans, 12 Democrats. Um, so this is what, uh, let's see, do I have this thing from uh, Evan Power, the Republican Party of Florida chairman? He wrote, uh, he said, quote, a little more than four weeks ago, Florida Democrats bit off way more than they could chew. They launched their ambitious Take Back Florida Distinction Program, where they claimed they'd win 21 competitive races against Florida Republicans, but they did not. Florida Republican candidates not only had better grassroots organization, but policy that left Florida Democrats biting the dust. Florida Republicans won 20 of the 21 competitive races Democrats highlighted. Uh, and he's like, it's it's just it's just very tough here for the Democrats. Do you um, and he, and, and yeah. Rick Scott's uh, framed uh, framed framed it like this on election night? Florida is the center of the Republican Party. It is, and and I think it was on this show or Florida this week. I said uh, two weeks ago that uh, 
Trump was going to win by 13 and Scott was going to win by 12. And I told you that a year ago and everybody, including you, made fun of me. I was wrong. Trump won by 13 and Scott won by 13. So I underestimated Well, we saw the that victory. the polls were right. Rick Scott was, um, Debbie Rickles of Powell was running against Rick Scott. And the polls were roughly, I think the average, real clear politics average is about four to five points. The polls had, had her down as, uh, or as close as three points. And, and that's because public polls, unfortunately, are not very good now. Right. Uh, FAU, UNF, they're all, they're doing what they call panel polls. And that'd be a whole show. But there's, this is how you do polling. You do polling by live calls, which is the most accurate. The second most accurate is if you do an IVR poll, which means an automated, you push numbers in. And the, then you go to text polls, and then you go to uh, email online polls. Mm-hmm. Oh, and then the, the least accurate is panels. Some of these panel polls, we know they're going to be 20 points off. What, uh, do you, what do you mean by panel polls? So I pick... I get uh, Ray Rao and you to sign up to be on a panel, and every time we have a poll, once a month, I send you the poll. Okay. Well... Unfortunately, for accuracy, liberals are more likely to sign up and do these polls than conservatives. And Republicans really believe that they are being tracked by legacy media, and they're going to be outed, and they're going to be uh, canceled. And so it's very difficult to get these polls. But that's why David Halpern wrote when he saw internal polling for uh, Kamala Harris. she was no. She, the internal polling for Kamala showed you what happened on election night. And I saw things like that with the Trump campaign. The internal polls showed you what happened election night. That's, so we know that. And uh, people like Matt Towery, who lives in St. Petersburg, right. and Robert Cahaley, their polls were highly accurate because they found ways to find Republicans. But there's a different type. There's two types of Republicans. Like, I like Matt Florell used to do great jobs when people would polls. answer. Yeah. But now he can't because a Republican who will answer his poll is a 50-year-old who lives at home with his parents, not a 50-year-old Republican like me. Yeah, let me ask you through your experience through all these years and in this last election, what role did right-wing publications from Fox News down to Florida outlets and these really hyper-local outlets that we have here, what role did they play in this election as far as swinging folks who were on the fence about whether they would hold their nose and vote for Trump? You know, these kinds of people who don't respond to the polls. Humongous. In fact, we saw in the polling the number one reason why people who voted for Biden that could vote for Trump, the persuadables, were where they were from. If they were born in the Middle East, they were likely to go to Trump. The second reason... The second most likely people that voted for Biden that could vote for Trump were people that listened to Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan has 15 million daily listeners, and uh, that's twice what the NBC Evening News uh, audience is. And so when Kamala Harris didn't go on there and she en- and he endorsed, those were persuadable voters. I listen to all three newscasts. I tape them every night and watch them. I'm not a persuadable voter. Mm-hmm. I know what I'm going to do two years out. How many of the persuadable voters are they actually out there? Okay, so we found that people vote... Uh, for the, I think the last segment by their tribe, mm-hmm. and I worked the poll uh, in St. Petersburg at the at the supervised elections next to the city hall. Yeah, and we had the Democrats on one side, the Republicans trying to hand out palm cards, and I was in the middle just counting. And out of two hundred people, only four took palm cards. The other one said, "Oh, isn't their party on the ballot already? They were going to vote straight." Party and by the way, uh, some states, they do have that, right? They you do just have, go click. Yeah, they, they do. Believe it or not, have it. By the way, if you're just tuning in right now, it's 1129. You're listening to The Skinny here in WMNF. Mitch Perry, Ben Montgomery, Ray Roa. We're with Barry Edwards. They're talking about the election. Here. And, and I want to finish up one, one little yeah. thing with Ray. Is, so now the media is fractured. Used to go, the, the St. Pete Times, when Senator Rassan got elected to the state Senate, when they endorsed him, he surged 20 points. Their endorsement was worth 20 well, How long points. ago was that? that, that 2016. Mattered. Mm-hmm. That recent is two thousand eight years ago. The right. Tampa Bay Times recommendation, not endorsement, recommendation, carried that much weight. Carried that much weight. It was worth a quarter of a million dollars, half a million dollars. Uh-huh. Right. Media. Right. Right. And now, but also people took it to the polls. Right. Now, and I was wrong. I'm going to admit one of the rare times Barry Edwards is wrong. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Hold you know, on, guys. The I radio did, is going to break here. I did not realize how much Republicans hate legacy media. There were people that brought the Times endorsement. I thought they were going to vote for us. I said, oh, no, we're voting against their recommendations mm. for the amendments. <laughs> And they said, isn't that a trash newspaper? And I said, no. And I mean, so Republicans hate legacy media and do not trust it, where the Democrats and independents do trust president. it. Right. Do trust it. And, 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 but anyway, so again, so we'll, we'll move away from polls. But I do think, again, with this, I was saying this before the show began uh, with Ben, is they basically, you know, the polls were, uh, again, underestimating Republicans, right, nationally. There, there's no, anybody who was voting for Kamala Harris in my neighborhood had a Kamala Harris sign. There were people I know in my neighborhood that were going to vote for Trump, but they didn't want to do it. Really? Because they, they didn't want... They the, didn't want the, 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 the hidden with a shy Trump voter. They right, the, the bashful sh- Trump voter. Yeah. And that so, still exists. That still exists. More they than did, ever, I guess. They don't want to be vilified. Well, no. now I think you're going to see very few of them because now they dominate. They won the... And, and they're the dominant 
force in America. So let's talk about uh, here in Florida. Uh, actually, let's talk about Hillsborough County. Uh, I, 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 my, it's my take that it was not as bad as it could have been in Hillsborough. Well, I think it was pretty bad, so okay. I'm going to disagree with you there. Okay, all right. It was right. a fiasco, and it was caused by the Hillsborough Democratic Party and the okay. chairman. Okay, Ion Absolute, Townsend? Absolutely, 100%. Okay, why, we're seeing a lot of criticism of Ion Townsend on social media in the last well, few it's, days. It's, ver- it's validated. She did, uh, when they had a pack set up for their Hillsborough Society, they spent about 40000 on voter registration. They got 30 to 60 registrants, so that's a waste of money. But then they did this massive $119,000 or $109,000 a digital voter registration. Well, in the period that they did it, the Democrats went from 12,000 up to 5,034 up. Okay? So they were registering three to one Republicans. Really? Because they don't know when you click on the link when it goes to the who they're going to register. So if you look at that, that's the margins that Cindy Stewart and Sean Shaw lost by. Because you take the number that they registered, the gain, you take that they voted at 80% and 95% of them voted straight ticket. Sean Shaw would be a county commissioner today, and so would uh, City, City Stewart, Stewart if they hadn't done those. Uh, if Ione hadn't done wasted that money. Wow. Okay. And there's a, there's a lot of pushback on other parts of with uh, Ione, but we'll see how it plays out there. Well, Ione's been there since in, in leadership since 2012, right? And the Democrats right. have. have how much they, they soared. They, they, they did great. Right. There's, there's been ups, ups they were the and big, downs. They were one of the best successful okay. blue counties when, in the state. When she so got in, there was a demographic trend, right. and she took credit for the voter registration gaps. And I told her myself that you should that this should have nothing to do with that. But now she doesn't have anything to do with the voter registration decline. You can't take credit and not take the blame. Okay, let's go but to, demographically, yeah. Hillsborough has changed. Yeah, absolutely has changed. Let's go to the phones. Let's go to a Simon calling in from Lakeland. Hi, Simon. You're on the skinny. Hi. I wanted to call back. I wanted to ask Barry a question. He mentioned that people vote by tribe, and I would agree with him wholeheartedly. I wanted to present to him the Pew research of the projected 25-0 population in the United States. The white population is going to decrease from 67% to 47%. The Hispanic population will double from 14% to 29%. The black population will remain the same from 13% to 13%. And the Asian population will remain the same from 9% to 9%. That being said, that the Hispanic population is going to double and that the white population is going to drop by 20%. Looking at the black community, why would they, with due respect, why would they vote Democrat if the immigration issue affects them personally in the ability of jobs. And second of all, why would they vote for the Democratic Party knowing that they could uh, increase their populist growth by not having abortions? Well, I, I, I don't uh, think I don't think people get strategically into voting like that. So I think that's the second part. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but let's look at this. In Florida, um, my client and friend, Daryl Rasson, is the chairman of the Florida Legislative Black Caucus, the, the most important black caucus in the state. Sixty uh, percent of the returning Florida legislators that are Democrats are African-American. Sixty percent. That's the real issue is that the Democratic Party now electorally in Florida does not look like Florida. When 60 percent of your legislators or African-American, you do not represent. In the Florida Senate, there's 12 senators, seven are black, one's a gay black man, Chev Jones, Right. Uh, so you got that, but then you have five other senators, two are Jewish women, one is a white straight woman, one is a straight white guy, and then you have a Hispanic gay man. That does not look like Florida, and the, the, one of the, the big reasons is when Ron DeSantis won the first time is Bill Galvano raised $40 million in the st- Senate races, and they just poured out this effort. And I'm going to, and now real quick. Yeah. So one of the reasons why the Democratic Party lost this time too is they recruited candidates for every race. Right. And you say philosophically that's the they right thing to do. They boasted about that. Now some of these candidates were hundreds of miles away we learned. Well, and, but, well not only that but here and, and, and Danny Alvarez's opponent mm-hmm raised $4,000. He was going to shut off his campaign at $50,000. He told me at the Jan Platt Library he's going to spend $600,000. That was $600,000 that was spent turning out Republican voters. Ben Braver ran against uh, Danny Burgess. He raised $10,000. Danny Burgess rolled over a million dollars and spent a half a million dollars turning out Republicans in Hillsborough County alone. That was a strategic error, a tactical error, and Nikki Fried should resign Well, you're getting it. to the point, though, about one of the problems here is that the, the, the money disparity is Thanks ridiculous. Thanks for the call, Simon. It, it's, it's outrageous in terms of the, uh, of the yeah, money you, here. Thank you, Simon. And that is, like, so, Bear, do you have any numbers about, like, say, what the Florida Senate uh, House brought in versus the Republican House? Yes. You know? uh, so, uh, the last quarter, Fentress Driscoll raised about $4 million. For the Democrats, for the House Democrats. Okay. But before that, she'd been outraised uh, 
you know, probably by eight million dollars for total spending. But in the Florida Senate, it was more. It was a, a better example because uh, I so. Pizzo raised probably seven or eight million dollars for the whole for cycle. The Democrats, Senate Democrats. The Republicans raised about forty. Forty million versus how much? Seven. Yeah. So that's the disparity. Right, and, and you're okay. So forty million versus seven million in the Senate, and this is a state that already has seven percent more Republicans in terms of like the voter registration breakdown. It's over a million, a hundred thousand now at this point. And they vote three and a half percent higher. They vote right. That's what we saw on Tuesday, right? We saw even with the disparity naturally that we have in the state in terms of more Republicans than Democrats, and at least the Democrats participate. You know, they can make it more maybe a game, but Democrats. Uh, okay, it was different than two years ago where it was 15% less uh, vo- voting, 14.5, I believe it was, which is why Charlie Crist got blown out by 25 po- uh, 20, 19 points. Well, these 20 weren't cents. close races. Scott and Trump statewide, right. 13 points. And that's what I said on this show, I think, even l- the last time you had me on. This is the new normal. A Democrat cannot win Florida statewide. It doesn't matter how much resources you right. have. The marijuana amendment had $114 million. Now, they got to 55%, but it doesn't matter. The, the, the state is just... Too locked in for Republicans. The Republican statewide nominee will not win by less well, than 10 Well, let me ask you this. And Rick I, Scott is your example of that, winning yeah. by 13. Right. A shocking after Rick Scott had ran three races. I think we have a bet on that, by the way. 1%, 1%. And what, I the, don't know if it's shocking, though, with the number of Republicans right. who moved here after COVID and continue to well, move that's here. Right. When you add a million more Republicans, that's how I predicted the county commission losses. Mm-hmm. You take the new registrants, you take what percentage they're going to turn out, they're going to vote 95% straight ticket, you add that to the totals that are Sparibus, and you got your margins. Well, and that's also, what, it what was. I want to ask you about because I think uh, Democrats really were hoping for the NPAs, the independent. Oh, I've, I've got. Okay, a... no, hold on, hold on. So they, 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 that <laughs> was thoughts. the savior. We, no, we saw that in, 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 in Congressional District 13, right? Where Whitney Fox, who we've had, we had on the show just a couple. I weeks think ago. we have a bet on that one. Too. Actually, actually, last Friday we had her on. Ten she, points. That she, was. She, she won. Shockingly, I think it was shocking. Uh, I would. I told you ten points okay, last year. But she she won by eight point. Uh, excuse me, Anna Paulina Luna. That's a, a, a carved up gerrymandered district, uh, formerly Charlie Chris's district. So. Uh, uh, Whitney Fox, a moderate Democrat, was well, running. I would disagree okay, with that. hold on here. Very easy now. All right, so we were. Uh, the point was that she was appealing to. She had to appeal to Republicans, right? Not only and independents. So the idea being, if I can bring all my Democrats with me, I can bring some Republicans with me, and I can bring a lot of the independents with me. I might have a fighting chance. Now, I, I, I thought it was really, inten- you know, very hard for her to do that. But she, she did th- it effectively. She did she not by ten day. points. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm not saying it worked. Right, right. I'm saying it takes something else. Uh, it takes like a Bernie Sanders style disruption, like David Brooks argued this morning, uh, to to for them to figure out which way they want to go. I don't think it's toward the center. Oh, interesting. Um, oh, sorry, uh, so, so, so like, yeah, the, the point we're talking about here is that the de- in, at least in this case of CD13, the independents did not save Whitney Fox. The independents did not save the Democrats at all. When they look at like, okay, 29% of the electorate is independent, NPA, it's 26%. And 3%. Only going up. Um, right. It's, 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 uh, a lot of people don't, but younger people, Bree, um, you, now you are a Democrat. Can we get the microphone to Bree for a second? Um, but, but you're, are you a hesitant de- Democrat? I mean, is there, if there was other parties available that were, you know, we had more than two parties. <laughs> Open maybe. primary, maybe? Yeah, no, I, I definitely don't exclusively call myself a Democrat. I mean, I'm part of the socialist groups. I am very progressive and Democrats are not progressive anymore. They always want to play to Republicans, and then you're going to lose Democrats. We don't want to vote for you if you're not really for us. We're going to go for third parties if we can, or we're just not going to vote for you. That's why Kamala probably lost a lot of people, too. So, so Barry, back to this NPA discussion. So you have told me in the past that I wrote a, lot, on it. a lot of people think that NPAs are, are centrist voters, that, that they're not really left or right. They're more in the middle. But you say that's not correct. We have hundreds of thousands, millions of interviews done by the University of Michigan and Stanford, both legitimate universities. And there's three types of independents. There's what we call a Republican leaner. A Republican leaner, which is why the independents in Florida now, we think, vote about 60-40 for the Republicans. In the Corey Simon district, they voted 70 30. In Tallahassee. In Tallahassee. Yeah, so if you're a Republican leaner, you're more reliable Republican voter than a non-primary voting Republican. And you voted, you registered independent because you think the Republican Party is a bunch of loser liberals and not conservative enough. And there used to be about a third, a third, and a third for these three groups. Now it's about 45 to 50 percent of independents in Florida only vote for, or le- because the people that moved here the last four years, right. only vote Republican. So you, Republicans are starting out with half the independent vote from day one. The second group are Democratic leaners that think Barack Obama is a conservative fascist and the Democratic Party is a bunch of loser mm-hmm. uh, conservatives. They don't want to be Democrats. And those people are, are well, and, and, and this was validated by the Bernie Sanders races and the Trump races when Bernie Sanders had an open 
open primary with independents could vote, he did much better. When it was a closed primary, he did worse. So the, the independents are more liberal on the Democratic leaner side. They used to be about a third. Now they're about 30 percent. And then the, the middle group are the true swing voter independents. In Florida, they're less than 20 percent, we think. Okay, now. so 20 so percent of, of those of, of, of eligible voters that you can maybe persuade to your side, you're saying. Right. So, yeah. so, so people going after independents, right, that are truly in the center, only about one-fifth of the independents. And I don't want to get too off track of where I think Mitch is going, but, you know, we're talking, you've got a lot of facts here, right? Um, so when you look at the leadership for the Democratic Party, where does it go from here in Florida? Is there anybody out there? Well, you who need can to do something. Okay, so, and we know, and I love my colleague here, I, or, or I just met, is very is, is very nice, and I like and I, I like her passion. But we have actually data on what sells and what doesn't sell. We have the Andrew Gillum race where he ran as a liberal, left of center. We had the black woman who ran as the conservative for agriculture commissioner. You had Jeremy Ring for CFO, and you had Sean Shaw for attorney general. So Sean ran as in a twenty eighteen as yeah. the most progressive. Okay, and so, Andrew didn't spend all his money. Let's talk about that. Well, uh, that didn't build but, in that okay, yet, but but okay, so the conservative. Most conservative candidate in that race was had no Democratic establishment support, got the highest vote. The the black woman, the black woman running for ag commissioner. The second highest vote was Jeremy Ring, who ran as a conservative. CFO. CFO. And then Andrew Gillum. So Andrew Gillum and Sean Shaw are both African American. Right. Gillum got eight hundred and eighty thousand votes more than Sean Shaw, because Sean Shaw ran as a progressive. So I think in Florida we can tell you the more liberal you are, the worse you are going to do electorally. Well, people thought that when uh, Gillum beat out Gwen Graham and also Phil Levine, the mayor of Miami Beach, both of those I talked to afterwards, they were convinced that they had won the, the primary, that they would have beat Ron DeSantis. We'll never know. By the way, I wanted right, something that we have. It would have been a list. totally different dynamic. Whistler, you're right. Whistler writes and says, Le- Legacy media openly said that conservatives and white men were racist, especially if they had an American flag in their yard. If we uh, if we had it, let's see, I'm trying to read this. If we had to take it down... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to read this puppy here. Uh, moving this over here, folks. I'm sorry, this is not good radio. Hold on. Okay. Um, they said that conservatives were white men, were, and conservatives and white men were racist, especially if they had an American flag in their yard. We had to take down our flag out of fear of the yard, yard signs being stolen and cars get, get, got keyed. A uh, YouTube, Facebook still monitor and censor speech. Politely write into YouTube, watch 2,000 miles. Okay, that's a, uh, you will be banned for two weeks in your company. So this writer, this listener says that he's a conservative and he thinks that uh, the me- legacy me is against him here. Now, here, there's another person who writes, why would you say you are socialist? This is not a socialist country. And if someone wants that, there are other countries available. Um, okay, it sounds like we're in South Florida here now. Uh, okay. Uh, by the way, we have Chris on the line here. By the way, we, we want, uh, folks, if you want to call in right now, maybe you're objecting to something you're hearing here. 813-239-9663. You're listening to Skinny here on WMNF. Hi, we've got Chris on the line from Clearwater. Chris, well, I lost uh, my... Yeah, the, you know, the, I think that uh, what Trump, what got Trump elected is, uh, for a lot of folks, is the promise of RFK Jr. to reverse the trend of a decreasingly healthy country uh, by promoting um, health. So we won't be divided and work together by having the necessary physical and mental health, the mental focus, the memory to have the time for patient conversation uh, by also raising our standards of living. And and what we got is, uh, I don't know if it's the lesser or the greater of two Zionists, but, um, you know, even Zionist. if Israel were to cease to exist, as many wish would happen, the, the bankster gangsters of the privately owned Federal Reserve would continue to parasitize our economy. Okay, do you have a, a, economic power? Can you boil it down for us, Chris? <laughs> Where, where are you coming well, from here? Still, regardless of who's selected, uh, we still need to seek solutions that okay. don't depend on politicians like community currency, barter networks, time banks, cooperatives, and swap shops. Now, it's clear that Trump and Harris were both blackmailable through the Jeffrey Epstein, Ghislaine Maxwell pedophile network. Okay, all right, and, thank uh, you. Again, conspiracy mind. Thank you, Chris, for the call. Again, 813 Barry, I have a question about that. Those kinds of viewpoints and, and conspiracies and things like this and echo chambers did play in a lot into this election what what is your uh, like on research both sides. play um there like and how does you can can quote unquote legacy media and newspapers break through that i mean well you know i used to be on the pointer board and i hope it does uh and 
uh, but for for these types of uh, the, the, What's these fringe of it? and these fringe <laughs> groups that, and and uh, and I don't, I don't say that in a pejorative, but well, I guess it is a pejorative that get online. And my brother's on the Council of Foreign Relations, and I was at an event, and I was told that he was really a lizard. They had captured my brother, and then he made him a lizard. Mm. I oh, mean, this cool. stuff is just nonsense. Uh, this can bring, can we bring up the Tampa Bay Times and uh, lack of a recommendation for the president in the U.S. Senate? Because Ray, I wanted to bring this up. I wrote this up very last it was a great week. idea for them not to do that. Really, you believe so? But because the timing. It, Barry was very questionable. Well, they had made the decision before. They didn't reveal it. But right. here's why it was important. Yeah. They wanted to have impact on school board races, on judicial races. If they had had a bell-ringing endorsement for Kamala Harris, then people would have looked at it and they would have shredded it even more. Uh-huh. So then you would have even lost more impact. Right, because, they, because again... It, this Especially, remember, their, their service area voted heavily. Both counties voted for Trump. Yes, the Hillsborough so, so they would have, and then they would have endorsed uh, uh, Debra Muscarello so, Paul. They'd endorse in the Senate race either. No, they, and those races. So you got two losers at the top where, where your people said, "Oh, you're wrong," and then they wouldn't have followed through so on they, the lower they, ones. They would have lacked. The, the, we already think the Times is already losing influence daily. Yeah, basically. I mean, you said that people were bringing the Times recommendations in there too explicitly vote against them on the on the on the uh, amendments but yeah. the timing was horrible here after coming after the washington post and la times came out with o- pressure from the ownership in this case of the times owned by the pointer institute they famously always p- said we were insulated from getting pressure so this in this case maybe this is self ben i'd love to hear you weigh in the former times and they were self pressure but it was smart pressure because it made their endorsements impactful as much as they could be what do you think, Ben? What if the uh, well? I, I'd like to entertain this notion that uh, the press, uh, by and large, for four years or so, has sort of been compiling or compiled enough evidence to like stake the claim that Donald Trump is the bad candidate, even in news coverage. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, every introduction of him uh, is followed by uh, his bona fides, which now include cr- criminal counts. Um, I think, what about the notion that half of us just got sick of hearing the media tell us what to do in this election? I think that, I I think you can absolutely say that Barack Obama and Michelle Obama had an inst- had a consequential imp- impact on black males voting for Donald Trump, and we saw this. I saw this in over a thousand surveys done in Pennsylvania. They were tired of being lectured to by black elites on that if you don't vote, you're not a brother. If you don't vote, you're a misogynist. All these things. They said, "Well, screw you. You know, we're not dumb. You know." And now we got a black man telling us, and a black woman who make ten who live in a ten million dollar house that we're not black. Screw him. So, so Brock and Obama. Forget about Obama for a second. Though. What Ben's point about is the media overall. You know the messaging because uh, I always I always say that even if Trump had lost, the media couldn't quit Trump. You know, I mean, it's like that's what you see when you watch MSNBC. You hear more about Trump than you do about Kamala Harris. Well, well the MSNBC has just got saved because their ratings are yes, up two sure, three million a day. Exactly. Yeah, but and, what if and Fox it's not, is going to plummet? Yeah, now. Th- this presidency is actually good for the media. I think. Yeah, but what if it's not about like having influence like when when you make a decision to say oh I'm, I'm putting these endorsements out so i can have an impact what if you're just talking about your own institutional values of the paper right if we already know that people aren't reading quote-unquote legacy media or voting against it then are is the point of the endorsement to say these are the the, the values and virtues of our publication well i mean that's a, an argument but i always uh, go to that you can't govern if you don't win and if you want you know, Amendment Four, Amendment Three. I Joe Gruder's my, one of my old clients. You know, is for uh, for Amendment Three. Yeah. And so, if you want to impact that on, you, you gotta. You don't always have to be right to win. But do you think the Times wants to be right on on stuff or have an impact? Like oh, they definitely want to have have an impact. They, and they're worried about readers lose, leaving L- losing losing readers, readers. readers because if you don't yeah. have a. Anybody buying your paper? Right. You don't have any. By the way, we've got uh, Bubba writing and saying, "How long before the orange shirts, which he puts uh, the Trump equivalent of Hitler's brown shirts, are recruited?" Okay. Well, I got to say, I think that we ought to all take a deep breath. America, unlike any European democracy, and I have people in Mitchell tell I want to say that that important in my life wanted to flee to Europe. And didn't eat for two days because of this. And I said, look, America's not like a European democracy where you go from an ultra-liberal to an ultra-conservative. We have, first of all, we have a federated system. We have 50 states and our territories. So you have divided power there that's in the Constitution that even conservative Supreme Court justices, they're probably going to be more likely to uphold states' rights. Then you, And then within the states, you have your counties and cities. But at the federal level, you have a judiciary that has put some checks on Trump. They People could argue about the immunity, but that wasn't as broad as I think people think it is. But you have that, and you have the checks of the divided of a Senate and a House. 
the Republicans said they're keeping the filibuster. That means the Democrats can stop right. over-the-top things. Even if they get 55 votes, they don't have 60 votes. Right, they don't have 60. Yeah. And in the House, you only need four or five Republicans to bolt. And right now, we're waiting for this at the House, right, for that to be counted. And, and I'm, I was understanding, I was reading Punchbowl News this morning, that it may be at best maybe two or three, kind of like they have right now. Right. For, I think that, for Mike Johnson, House Speaker Mike Johnson, that's a big headache for him because he doesn't have enough of a coalition, really. And I think that you saw... And and this is for and this is maybe hopeful on my part, but my friends that are close to Trump and you know who they are, said that he wants to make a legacy now. He just got shot. Hopefully that had some impact on his life, and not enough as we may have wanted. But by choosing Susie Wiles, he chose an establishment Reagan Bush Republican against the MAGA's wishes. So he put somebody who's going to bring order. He doesn't want chaos anymore. He has four years, and he's out. He's going to start to try to establish legacies. And I think that that's a moderating position when he wants – remember, he likes to read about himself, and he likes to see – Susie Wiles, the first ever woman chief of staff. chief of staff. And she is the most – talented. And she said her favorite Republicans in Florida were Joe Gruder's. Her least favorite was Ron DeSantis. I think that... Are uh, we going to see... Uh, Ron DeSantis' uh, career is now uh, done. Uh, no, uh, are we, are we going to see uh, uh, Are we going to see Florida Republicans in, in powerful national positions pretty I, soon? I and what that, happens with any special elections if Marco Rubio goes? Who leaves? Well, okay, there, Who leaves Florida? Okay, so if Marco Rubio goes, there is no special election. No. There would be a appointee? appointee by the governor Why? to fill out two years, and then you'd oh, have the election. Oh, okay, okay, two okay. years. Right, because he's got four years left. Right, right, so you'd have two years. as He'd be... The, the, the whoever it would be would be the incumbent for two years. DeSantis has said he would not appoint himself yesterday. Okay, so right that'll be an interesting, fascinating point to see. But you know that could always change because <laughs> now he knows there's not get, he's not going to be attorney general. Uh, people that are on the transition team that you know locally, uh, Pam Bondi is on the presidential transition team, very influential. Uh, Joe Gruders is on the transition team, very influential. Did, did Joe Gruders get a job in the administration. I would think that he he, he if you read the endorsement that Trump did to him for CFO, yeah, uh, he, he can either walk in. I'm probably unopposed for CFO because uh, the Republican Democrat is irrelevant in, in the state right now. But or he could probably, you know, get a cabinet post and and because he was MAGA before there was MAGA. He in 2012 did the Trump event in Sarasota. Yeah. They, they, they get twice Sarasota Man of the Year, Joe Trump. By the way, if you're just tuning in right now, it's 1152. You're listening to Skinny here on WMNF. I'm Mitch Perry with Ben Montgomery, Ray Rowe. And there's some congressmen in Florida that are and thinking Walsh. getting... Uh, Can I ask Barry a personal question? Oh, well, maybe. <laughs> Barry, Barry, like, you know, we talked to Bree about how she's doing. What do the next few years look like for you, and how much has your job changed um, as but, far but, as... But Barry as, goes both ways in terms of a Democrat and Republican, <laughs> so you'll be, you'll be fine, right? No, but I mean, like, <laughs> don't mean like the way that you view the data that you collect. Like, how much has it changed, and how much has your mind been blown by what's happened? It's changed a lot. Uh, my parents were World War II were great generation. And so the, my values as the youngest of all the, the kids really was framed by that. And, you know, they had trouble in 16 voting for Trump. Uh, but now everybody has just got past that, that whole civility. I mean, and I used to do a lot of radio and I never swore on it. I never said things that were too over the top because I didn't want my mother or father to be embarrassed or offended. Now there seems to be Good no, son. You know, there, there's no embarrassment level that we have anymore. I mean, we just say crazy stuff. We don't back it up. I, I got a lot, meet a lot of influencers. They just make stuff up or plagiarize all the time. Mm. Uh, so that's one of the things that people are misinformed I mean, there's some things that are fact. Pat Moynihan said, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own set of facts. And that, when, when Trump says that the tax, that tariffs are not taxes on us, that's factually incorrect. We're the one who pays it. China doesn't pay it. Let's bring up DeSantis for the last five minutes of the program here, because that's what, that's what we're dealing with. Ron DeSantis, Florida, that's our existence right now. And he's got two long years left here. And he just got boosted by big wins in these two constitutional he did, amendments. Even though he'll feel good about the fact that a majority of people voted for cannabis and voted for abortion rights, he, won. he can boast that he won. You're correct on that. Um, so that's going to be a boost. We're going to have the session coming up in a few months. We're going to see about that. He wants to have a special session, I believe, on condo reform, right, because of the situation with this, uh, these fees now that are hitting these condos because of the Surfside legislation. And the legislature initially said, no, we don't think we need a special session. And now we'll see what happens when they meet in a couple of weeks. We're going to hear, you know, we only have like less than two months before supposedly some of these uh, condo owners are going to be really feeling it in terms of big well, assessments. Well, uh, so Ron DeSantis, anybody who said write him off and not powerful in Florida, he just reemerged. Yeah. And remember, Trump endorsed the marijuana amendment. Yes, and it's still lost. Yeah, lost. So, so yeah, right. And that's so. So Ron got over Don on that one. So so Gruder. Now that well, even though fifty five percent, he did have a majority. I like that Ron over Don. But he is still the significant player day to day in Florida. But Trump with now Trump as the as the sitting president is going to 
Well, singularly, he can no longer sue the government. Him and Pam Bond, or excuse me, uh, Ashley Moody, have been making a field day of filing <laughs> lawsuits about immigration and about uh, student debt and all these different things that he can no longer do. So we know that if if the, whoever Trump picks for the Republican nomination in Florida for governor will be the nominee and will win. We know that right now it's CFO is Gruters, uh, if, Matt Gates, perhaps. If, if Wilton doesn't run for governor, he'll be. Ag commissioner. If not, Ben Albritton will be the ag commissioner. So the question is, who does Trump want for CF for ag, for attorney general and governor? And that's so we're talking. It's not only a Ron DeSantis Ford; it's a Donald Trump Florida. He totally FBI. totally controls. If you have to make a choice, you ch- you ch- pick Donald Trump. So, do you believe the people who say I see this on social media, Ray Ray in here, you guys, about people who say they're going to move out of Florida now? No, now, the, yeah, exactly. I mean, we heard this at George W. Bush. But on this show, your guy got up and left the last time I was on, and we, and the census data proves that's wrong. But, but I mean, I mean, is this like um, basically like showing that um, I'm better than this? I mean, the mental. This. I get it on a, in a fleet basis. Like I can't deal with this now. But most people are not going to actually. I think. It. I think people would sooner move out of Florida because it's so expensive. expensive. Right. Right. Before any of that. And and let's face it, that is people just venting. And you, you sit here across from from Bree, who's t- 27 years old and remains resolute and committed to uh, the cause that she has. Um, I think you don't need to look any further than somebody Bree, like Bree, Bree get on to see what that's... So, so, yeah, I mean, look, we're talking about this landscape, and it, as you're feeling it, it happened with Amendment 4 and what you're doing, what do you think about the state? Do you think it can come back in terms of what you grew up like the, the state even being right now in terms of the politics? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to take a very long time. I think we went extremely conservative. And would I love to move out of the state? Yeah, I'm not going to because there's people here that need us. But I think it's banning more together now and, you know, working together for this. And I don't think, you know, progressive people are going to move here, though. So I think, you know, we're not going to have the government, but... We'll have each other and we'll continue to do, you know, mutual aid and organize and take care of one another even when the government isn't. So, well, we, you saw in Georgia, right, over the last five, six years, whatever, how it's become certainly a purple state. Right, and moved back toward the Republican the last two cycles. It, it, it did. Uh, Kemp had a big victory Brian over Stacey Abrams, and Trump had a big victory yesterday, uh, two days ago. Right, right. And we'll see when the Senate you know, comes up again. Uh, but but again, it, that was the action was at this year. If you're recovering politics in Florida, there was no, Hillary Clinton. They, pro, I guess, a, 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 a Kamala did not want Hillary around because Hillary came to Tampa of all places last Saturday to campaign. The very she last was already minute. coming, right? Yes, right. Yeah. Her, her husband was in Orlando. Bill Clinton was in Orlando the very last weekend. It was kind of weird. I mean, we didn't get any high-profile surrogates whatsoever because why would they? This is a state that ultimately was a 13-point state. For but I'd love to be invited by uh, Ray to write an op-ed in, in, in his Dude, paper. I was talking with Colin the other day. We don't have those voices that are, you know, we need more of that. But Florida has always been a conservative state. If you look back at the yeah. three paragons. A moderate state. Well, no, a conservative state. Ruben Askew lost his bid for the presidency because he thought that gay marriage should be Outlawed, he and he was 100 percent pro life. So that's your greatest governor of Florida's wait, history. Wait a minute, there was not even discussion of gay rights back when he was. Really he ran running. against, and, and that was one of the things he ran against: abortion rights and gay rights. There was Ruben discussion. Askew. Ruben Askew, and that's why okay. he lost in I'll Ohio. I'll save you one page but, in the next week's book. <laughs> Bob Graham, though. Bob Graham sir, uh, gave out little uh, uh, chairs that were old Sparky that you put your finger in, and it would spark you. Brrr. He was a conservative, except on the environment, and and then you had Lawton Childs who in 18 years in the U.S. Senate, never voted for a pro-choice bill. He was anti-abortion until he became governor, and the FEA hated him. The, the teachers' unions hated him. So you had your three greatest Democratic leaders uh, of the modern era, and they were all conservatives. So we are just more conservative now and Republican conservative. I think mm-hmm. we like to think of Florida as a more moderate place than what it really is. You know? We do, but uh, not, I think it's now you can see that it's not. But its whole history is, uh, you know. And, and for the for the marijuana and the abortion, it wasn't fueled by why they got the numbers why, uh, uh, by Republican women. As you saw, like in Florida this week, last week, the Republican next to me said she's voting for Trump and for against the amendment. It was Republican males under 40 who don't want to be held accountable for being irresponsible. That's who are supporting Amendment 4, right. men. And then they voted Free straight Republican tickets. Like freaking out, yeah. and then they voted straight Republican tickets. It's true, though, right? Yeah, no, it is. It's yeah. very true. People are scared. And you know what? 
women are going to be careful and women are not going to want to be with men as much right now. Why would they be? You I don't could literally them. die. There are pregnant people <laughs> dying. Why would you want to be? People don't even want to get pregnant right now. Mm. Literally, yeah. even if you wanted to have a child, why would you do it in Florida? Why would you do it in America at this moment? Mm. Mm. Brie, thank you so much. Brie Wallace, joining. Director of Case Management at the Tampa Bay Abortion Fund. Barry Edwards, oh, political scientist. Force, and you owe me a column uh, before Monday, uh, 800 <laughs> words. Uh, I can't bed. get 900 words? No, I'll give you 900. Um, on behalf of myself, Mitch Perry, Ben Montgomery, Skip Sassy on the boards, Irene Matthews, thank you so much on the phones. I uh, I think I see Joe Ellen in Studio One with art in your ear. You've been listening to WMNF Tampa. We'll slowly pry ourselves away from the national election next week, but we, I don't think we quite know what we're talking about. But we can't wait to be back with you. We hope you have a very safe and somewhat peaceful weekend. Oh, yeah.